So welcome uh, to Linux Shell Debates, or How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love PowerShell. Uh, the history behind this session is kind of rooted in my own indecisiveness. Uh, I've been a full-time Linux user since 2019, both work and home. Uh, prior to that, I distro hopped for a long time before settling on Arch Linux. I use Arch BTW. I have to say that. It's obligatory. <laughs> and once I moved over to Arch in 2019, I was like, oh, I'm one of these Linux people full time now, what shell do I use? So it's like, do I use Bash? Do I use eShell? Do I use Fish? Do I use PowerShell? It was cross-platform at the time. And after shell hopping for a short amount of time, I just decided I love PowerShell. I'm gonna use it all the time. Um, but this is not gonna be a bashing session. There's, this isn't about one being right or wrong. Um, it's really just the right tool for the job. So about me, I've uh, been a PowerShell user for over 10 years. I think this is my fifth summit, second time speaking. I was gonna do one, but it was the year that got canceled. Uh, I'm a solution engineer at Lacework. We make a really cool security platform. I love Linux. I love writing code with NeoVim. I'm the NeoVim guy from the Lightning demos. Hopefully I got some people thinking how cool it can be. Not, not, nothing wrong with VS Code, but <clears throat> um, I love mechanical keyboards, so if I make a lot of typos, I'm not used to using my laptop keyboard. I'm used to a nice 50 or 60% keyboard. Um, Kale Jade Blue, or sorry, Kale Jades, the heavies. It's been a while since I built one. Nothing linear, it's gotta be tactile and clicky. Anthony asked what's my favorite keyboard switch, so just for the recording. Uh, and like a lot of people, I have a blog that I neglect all too much. There's some good stuff on there, it's just not good stuff that goes on there often, so there's some good things on there historically. Maybe I'll add some stuff soon, but. And that's me with a tiny horse. Oop, 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 we're flying through. So we're gonna cover today kind of the four questions to ask if you're in a, a place of indecisiveness. Hopefully this shortcuts some of that analysis paralysis and helps you figure out what the, the right thing to do is. We're gonna go through a demo. We're gonna talk about, you know, byte streaming shells compared to PowerShell. Some of that should be pretty, pretty common review. Um, we're gonna talk about POSIX compliance. That's kind of a, a whole rabbit hole in itself. Uh, Python, just, I feel like I preemptively put this in here because I figured I'd get a question. Well, Rob, where's Python come into this? So we'll talk about that. And last, we'll talk about PowerShell Crescendo. I know there's been a lot of content at the conference. This is not your exhaustive PowerShell Crescendo session, but we're gonna cover it. And then just some closing comments. So the four questions, this really, hopefully this helps you a lot. Just when you're deciding, am I gonna do this in Bash? Am I gonna write a shell that's POSIX compliant or not? Am I gonna use PowerShell? Just think of these things. Who's running it? What does it need to do? Where does it need to run? And when does it need to be run by? So as we go through this, just kind of keep those questions in mind. I'm gonna defer back to them <clears throat> probably at least a handful of times throughout this session. And hopefully it'll help you, you know, avoid some of the, the crazy overthinking of things that sometimes I find myself diving into. So, we're gonna jump into the demo now. And I had to put my Neo Fetch up, of course, again. I use Arch, by the way, proof. So, this is, a linear, this is bare metal. I'm, not, I'm one of those crazy people that, uh, that had, oh, sorry. Hopefully, that, hopefully that's better. Let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, also, size-wise, I tested this before everyone come out. You sh came out, you should be good till about table row eight. After that, I have no idea, you're on your own. Um, but yeah, so. It's bare metal, uh, we're gonna be doing this. It's mostly PowerShell, but we will see some Bash and some other things. I'm using Kitty Terminal, I've got my tabs there, but what I wanted to do is start by just talking about um, pipelines. I'm already in the directory, so let me pull this up. And there's really two primary type of pipeline architectures, at least that I know of, if there's, if there's more than that. I haven't really used them or experienced them myself, but uh, when you talk about typical Unix or Linux shells um, that are POSIX compliance, compliant, you really are talking about shells that utilize these standard input-output byte or data streams. So again, if you're asking what POSIX is, we're gonna get to that. <laughs> it's kind of a, a, you know, a whole mess, but shells that adhere to this byte stream architecture, you know, commonly include your Bash, your, your Z shell, uh, I think Fish as well, Dash, um, 
not PowerShell, and of course, Born Shell, the, the OG shell there. Um, and really what this allowed you to do, especially back in a day that predates me, was you'd have these utilities, you know, like PS to get processes, and then if you wanted to filter it, you could pipe it to grep. And a lot of these utilities were written in C, in that Unix error, and when they implemented this, you know, standard io.h library, it allowed them to take data in, write data out to standard out, data in from standard in, data out to standard out, and if there was an error, it would write to standard error. And if you're just using these at the terminal, you know, if I went over and did a PS, AUX, there's all the processes on my machine, um, but, and, and that's to standard out. But if I also wanted to filter that, let's just do grep, I don't know, I see Python there. And now what I've done with the PS command is I've got that output, went out on standard out, and then across the pipeline, the byte stream went to grep to filter on Python, standard in there, and then standard out, out to the terminal. And this is really pretty neato back in the day because it saved you from having to, you know, just allowed a lot more ease of use at the, at the terminal. You didn't have to write to a file and then have another desperate utility read from, read from that file and then change it. Uh, it allowed you to do things on the pipeline, which we're used to doing in PowerShell. <clears throat> so, we go back. I'm gonna show a couple examples of this. This is not very complicated examples. This is really just to show you, but um, I have a file, I have a CSV file, and it's very simple data, just three columns. It's got state, city, population. It's based off the US 2020 census data, 2022. And what it, it, it there's some anomalies here. You might notice on line two, um, that's actually the state of Alabama, so the state is included in this data. It's not my data set, but we're just using it for illustrative purposes here. But if I wanted to filter and say, you get this, get this information, and I'm gonna copy and paste because I am not typing all of this. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cat that whole file in, I'm gonna pipe it to grep, I'm gonna filter on Massachusetts, my, my home state, and we're gonna pipe that to sort. We're gonna say this, this is delimited by a comma. We want the third column, it's numeric, and we want it in descending or reverse order. So the K3, you know, N for numeric, R for reverse. And what I have, I still have my, you know, my, my CSV format there. Um, but you can see how this is convenient, especially back in the day, so you could easily work in the terminal to get this data out. And that's a byte stream, so that's just literal bytes streaming across the pipeline. One thing I will say about uh, byte stream pipeline is it's, it's very fast, so that is kind of a pro to it, but you end up doing a lot of regex. So if you've ever done any of this, you know, to get anything meaningful or to really customize this, you start having to use, you know, awk or sed to really manipulate the data in a way, because at the end of the day, it's still just text. There's no objects here. So that's the difference. Obviously, we all know PowerShell. We all know it's, it's object-oriented, so when you're talking about the PowerShell pipeline, you're actually passing rich.net objects across the pipeline. So, <clears throat> you know, in this again, very simple PowerShell, um, but we'll go ahead and run it. And there's a couple different ways you could do this. And I don't, I, I guess, if anybody's watching the recording, they're like, oh, these examples are so basic, they're so silly. Um, whether it's the PowerShell example or the Bash example, this is not a exhaustive lesson on how to, I guess, do complex pipelining. Um, there's some crazy good stuff out there. That's not the intent of this. But if I want to get this data, and I'm a sucker for clearing the screen, <clears throat> now what we have is all that same data. And this, this just used uh, import CSV, so I gave it to path to the file. One thing I want to call out that PowerShell does, there's a couple gotchas that I want to point out. When you do import CSV, um, by default, when it deserializes that CSV into PS custom objects, just know that it's actually doing that. This isn't text anymore. These are, these are actually objects. So if I look at this data, if I do a get member, you can see the type there. That these, when, when PowerShell did its magic, it converted those to objects automatically. Um, I could have done a get content and got a little crazy with that. But I just want to point that out. That also, this bit me years ago, uh, invoke rest method does that. So. Instead of giving you the raw JSON, it's giving you that deserialized JSON PS custom object. Um, just keep that in mind. But we can do a lot more interesting things now. And this is going to be common. I mean, this is stuff probably everyone's been doing. If I want to just see what item 56 is in there, index starts at zero, I can see that's Alabama, Pike County, 33,014 people. 
Um, so that's pretty cool. You know, I could do get random. I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> but if I want to filter this, and uh, let's see, when I make this big, yep, I usually get that. Give me one second. There we go. One second. Clear my typos here. There we go. So now I'm going to take those data objects. I'm going to pipe them into where object. I'm going to have a filter script that says look at state, match state on the property where it's equal to Massachusetts. This is object matching. I'm not just doing grep. Grep was just looking for the raw text. This is actually doing evaluation of the object. And then I'm going to take that subset of objects. I'm going to pipe that to sort object. Um, I do have to cast it, uh, the pop as an int when you when the CSV gets deserialized. They're all strings. If you're doing you know, the import CSV, just keep that in mind. And then same thing, descending order. And still nice thing, these are all objects. So this is, this is probably crazy review. We all know this. Um, I just want to show the differences between the two different pipeline architectures that are out there. And a lot of this stuff you'll actually find uh, if you ever go and read um, like the, the Monad Manifesto. A lot of the stuff that's in the other shells, like Bash, Corn Shell, Born Shell, uh, influenced some of the design choices of PowerShell. But it was a deliberate decision by Jeffrey Snover to do objects instead of text. Uh, Matt was going to have a book out there, but he put it away. <laughs> a shell of an idea probably goes into a lot more of that. But if you want to read the, the Monad Manifesto, uh, there's a link there. And this is all going to be on GitHub after. It's actually on GitHub now. You just don't have the, the link. <clears throat> so that's the differences between the two types of pipelines. So now I want to descend into the insanity. And uh, some of my, my friends and colleagues in the front here have heard me rant about this. <laughs> POSIX compliance. Ooh, one second. Wrong file. Wrong file. There we go. Markdown. So what, what is POSIX compliance? This, this, is, this is kind of, this, this tripped me up for a long time. So POSIX just stands for the Portable Operating System Interface. I guess they added the X just so it wasn't POSI, probably because it was related to Unix too. So they added the X, so Unix has an X, I don't know. But it's a standard defined by the IEEE um, that basically is a baseline set of standards for Unix-like operating systems, inclusive of Linux now, on just how things like the networking worked, how shells operate, how, well, you know, what the common utilities are, like, you know, echo, you know, test, uh, expert, expr, um, what loops look like, if, well, for. And it's basically, think of it as the bare minimum standards for a Unix-like environment. So there's a lot of different compliant and non-compliant shells. Uh, this gets into a realm of a debate, but Effectively, you know, Dash, the Debian Almaquist shell, that is strictly POSIX compliance. It has no bells and whistles. That shell does not cuss around. You, cannot, you can't write code in Dash and expect it to work in that shell. Um, Bash is one of the more common ones. Uh, it adheres to POSIX compliance, but it lets you do a lot of things that are not POSIX compliant, so you have to be careful of that. Uh, there's what people call Bashisms. So uh, just case in point here, when you do an if statement, which is, you know, you can use the, the, the square brackets, which is just basically another way of doing test. Um, single square brackets are POSIX compliant. Double square brackets are not. So if you write a bash script that has the double square brackets and you expect it to run in born shell or dash, it's not going to work. You're going to have a bad time. Um, and I have some scripts here in the demo. I just want to call out what a shebang is if you haven't seen it. It's, it's usually the first line of an executable script in a Linux or Unix environment, which says, this is the shell that needs to interpret the code below line one. So I'm um, not going to beat it up too much, but go check it out. So let's take a look. So let's start with bash. And a lot of these files have the same code. So you see my shebang, line one, I'm saying interpret, bash is going to be the interpreter here. Um, I'm going to write out a message about what the shell is uh, and then echo it. And then the same code is for, for all of them. So I'm always going to declare a variable of a with 5, b of 5, and then I'm going to have two if statements. One is POSIX compliant, one is not. And if it's POSIX compliant, we'll get a green success. If it's not, we'll get an error or nothing. Um, the t put set af2 and the t put srg0, that's just what's making the screen or the text green and not necessary, but I like text colors or color text in the terminal if you don't. 
I don't know why you hate fun that much, but it's not necessary for this, but I can't live without it. I usually like ANSI escape codes, but I did not want to figure out which shell supported them or not. That's why I'm using tput. So, so let's run it. So again, it's not, it's just, it's an executable file. I go run it. We get hello summit from bash, the, the born again shell. POSIX compliant code, numbers are equal. And the not POSIX compliant code, numbers are equal. That's what we expect. So similarly, I have the dash, the, the Damien Omquist shell. Um, same code other than the, the message on line three. So this one, again, the shell is very bare bones. Um, so if I go to run that, we'll see the hello message, uh, the POSIX if statement, numbers are equal, and then the second if statement, uh-oh, line 17, <laughs> says right there, the double square braces not found, because Dash has no concept of all the bells and whistles that might be in some other shells, so it is bare bones. So if you're not, if you write a shell script that's not POSIX compliant, this, you're gonna have syntax errors. Um, so born shell is another very bare bones shell. So same thing, just different message. Um, but we would expect, again, being a shell that has kind of a minimum subset, uh, that this second if statement will error like it did in dash. And when I run it, this, this freaked me out. Why did that work? So there's a little bit of history and there's a gotcha here. So if I just do a which uh, on shell, we can see that binary lives in user bin, that user bin, that's sh, that's, that's where the born shell lives. So then I did this. And it look, if you look at this, user bin sh is symbolically linked to bash. There's, that's, there's, no, there's no born shell, that's why it worked. So when I ran that, effectively, it just ran it in bash. So just be mindful of this, this is really, it gets tertiary, tertiarily related to the sub, the, the session, um, and I did a little digging. Dash, the, that Debian Almquist shell, the reason, it, it, I think it got added to Debian in like 2006 because, and you guys can fact check this, I don't, I don't have any Debian systems, but um, because of this, what we just saw, what they did is they had that very POSIX, strictly POSIX compliant shell, they added it, and then they symlinked the, the born shell to it so that if you did call or shebang the born shell, it would run in dast, which would have it had, had an error. So if I changed the symlink to dash, we would have had an error. But just be careful. Um, some distributions, I guess Arch Linux included, do, do that. So watch out. And then last thing, we, <laughs> we have PowerShell. Uh, I'm actually using, I, I'm, I'm typing cat, I have an alias to bat, which is like cat on steroids, but it doesn't have syntax highlighting for PowerShell, I guess. Um, but I, I mean, I can ask the audience here, you know, even line six and seven, do you declare variables like that in PowerShell? No. Nope. Do you declare if statements like that? So what do we think is going to happen? I thought so, but actually. PowerShell's a little slower with the initialization, but um, it gets a parser error. It doesn't even get to the point where it executes. That's why, Tony. Oh, it. when, it's, when it's just being parsed by the PowerShell interpreter, it, it chokes on that if statement before it even chokes on the variable declarations. Okay. So, but yeah, so PowerShell is not POSIX compliant. Uh, if, if you've used Fish, Fish is another nice shell that lives in, you can use on, on a lot of Linux distributions. Also not POSIX compliant. You can get into religious debates here um, about the merits of POSIX compliant versus not. <clears throat> so on, for fun here, I went down a rabbit hole. Uh, I went into, oh my gosh, like three Reddit threads, two Y Combinator threads. I just included one here if you want to watch strangers on the internet rip each other apart over something like POSIX compliant, um, which again, it's just an IEEE standard that came out, I think, Gosh, in the 80s, uh, the latest revision is 1003.1-2017. People like to argue over that stuff, I guess. So th this session is not about what's right or wrong. Uh, there's merits to POSIX compliant, and there's merits to not. Again, four questions. What do you need to run? Who's running it? You know, just keep that in mind, because if it needs to be POSIX compliant, then that's probably important. Um, also, there's compatibility checkers. There's the shellcheck.net. Again, sanitize your code before using something online. 
There's a command line one, but it's based in Haskell, which installs like a trillion packages, and I wasn't going to pollute my machine with that. And there's actually a Vim and a NeoVim extension, so I would be surprised if there wasn't a VS Code extension as well, if you care about checking POSIX compliant in the, uh, in the code. So last, well not last, next, I should say, where does Python come into this? And this isn't, I guess, strictly related, but I, I felt like, whoops. Let me just get set up here. We'll go here. Let me pull my file up. Kind of like uh, Steve Lee said when he was doing the thing. I keep these markdown files. They just uh, they keep me on track. And it's fun to look at, I guess, while I'm, while I'm talking. <clears throat> so where's Python come into this? Um, Python ships with a, a, a shell-like interpreter. It is not, I'd say, a functional shell in a traditional sense like any of the ones we've used so far. It strictly only can do Python code. And you can get to that by just, you know, in this case, typing Python. Here we are in the interpreter. So if I wanted to say message is equal to isummit, we want to print that out. Very basic. Again, this is not a Python session, so cool, look at that. What if we want to see the length of that? Holy smokes, it's 10 characters. So you get the point. Um, but if I want to say, oh, what, what's, what directory am I in? Where, where am I? Uh-uh. If I want to do you know, directory listing, uh-uh, nope. So you can't do that stuff in the Python shell. Um, and tidbits, like I taught you how to quit Vim the other day, and I'll, I'll show you again later. If you get stuck in the Python interpreter, just hit Control D, and then it pops you right out. So, Again, maybe some level of usefulness if you're writing Python. Actually, a cool thing you can do, I did this at my previous company uh, when I was using a Windows machine with a Windows terminal. I actually had a Windows terminal tab that would just open the Python interpreter. So if I was writing Python, I could just paste it into that tab and I still had my PowerShell and all that other stuff. But, um, but I later learned from uh, my good friend Tony here, because I was actually wondering where I first heard of this. So let me just go back. So, there is a shell, and I'm not going to be able to, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation. I don't think there was any reference on how to pronounce it on their website. It's called Exonch, Sanch. I think it's like a, a shell, like a crustacean-themed name. Um, but it's a shell that exists that can interpret Python code as well as let you use native utilities. And I have that here on, on my fourth tab. So, you know, if I wanted to do the same thing, same message, hello from... Exonch, Exonch, I don't know. I can do that, look at that. Sweet native code in the, Python native code in the terminal, and I can do a directory listing, or I can check my processes. And this is pretty cool, this is actually very similar to PowerShell, um, where you, know, you can dump PowerShell code into the PowerShell shell, or you can use native, term, you know, native utilities, and it just works. So, if you're, a, if you're a Python enthusiast and you want a shell that's like PowerShell, but just for Python, definitely check it out. Uh, credit to Tony for discovering it, I think about a year ago. Um, but yeah, and just for fun, and I guess because we have a little bit of time, I had something a little bit more exciting, so let's do some JSON. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna import the JSON in Python library. Uh, I'm going to create a variable J. It's going to stuff some manual JSON in it, just with a key, a summit, and a value of 2023. I'm going to print out that whole value or that whole variable, um, and then I'm just going to say, "Give me the, give me the value of summit, which should be 2023." And cool, look at that right there. You can see it the, you know, under the print that last print statement. So, again, pretty cool. It's very similar to PowerShell. Where does this apply? I, you know, and actually, I will sit, I fully admit, I don't know if, if Exonch is POSIX compliant. I didn't look it up, but I did want to just show this is where Python can come into play. Uh, you have some options there, so that's pretty nifty. So finally, this mic is, uh, this mic's temperamental. Keep my head up like this. All right, one second. Let's talk about Crescendo real quick. This is not an exhaustive Crescendo session, but. So I took this from the help file. If you do get help, 
um, about underscore crescendo. It'll say the PowerShell crescendo module provides a novel way to create proxy functions for native commands via JSON configuration files. And that is absolutely true. Um, I went down a little bit of a crescendo rabbit hole, and I kind of was feeling like Ian Malcolm in Jurassic Park when he says, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to bash crescendo. It's a very powerful tool. It's a nice tool to have in the tool belt. Um, much like I said with my NeoVim session, crescendo is similar where it's assembly required. You can do some very simple things in it, but if you really want to PowerShellize a native command, uh, there's some upfront work there. It's not including some code. So it might be light work, it might be a lot more. Keep the four questions in mind. Again, if you have, say, maybe you have a team that knows PowerShell cold, they're coming from a Windows environment, and now you have this project where you have to do a bunch of Linux stuff, and you have a year to convert some native commands so that the team knows how to use it. it might be a great use case, um, but if you're already, you know, in a, in a Linux environment, you're just used to switching between native commands and PowerShell, might not be worth the time to try to convert them. So don't overthink it. Remember the four questions. It does have a well-documented schema, which is nice. Um, so if you're, you know, if you have that in the file and you're in your favorite IDE, VS Code, uh, NeoVim does it as well. It'll have some IntelliSense. And it comes with great examples, so you don't have to start from scratch. You can reference the examples. I have the path up there. And it, this is where it gets a little chewy. If you want to influence the output, uh, this is where you're going to have to write some code. This is where you're going to have to write code that's probably similar to some of the regex that you would need to put in to your typical like st byte streaming pipelines to parse that standard output, which is text, and convert it to a PowerShell object. So I have some examples. I'm going to start with just ls. And this is what the, you know, the example file looks like. Um, pretty cool. So this is going to do create a invoke-ls command, the original name. Um, we have some properties here. I guess I have a, a, a linting error there, but it'll still work, so don't worry about that. This is just out of the box. I didn't create this. So you two can follow along at home if you want to make a proxy function for ls. So if I do this, and thank goodness for PS readline, because now I don't have to type this, um, what I'm going to do I'm going to do export crescendo module. I'm going to reference that configuration file. We've got to give the module a name. I'm going to call it PSLS. And look at that. Pretty, pretty neat. We've got, two, uh, we've got a manifest and a module file there. I usually put my functions in individual, like a functions directory, but you can always tweak it down the road. Uh, so if we import that module, and we do a get command, we can see the function we generated. So invoke ls, <coughs> and if I do an invoke ls, there we go. So we've now made a proxy function here for ls. Now we can do PowerShell like invoke ls, and it's going to have similar functionality, but without, again, going crazy with it. We don't have any colors or anything nice. So again, that's where there's some assembly required. So I wanted to do a couple non in the box examples. So next, um, so on Arch Linux, quick background, the package manager for Arch is called Pacman. Uh, it's similar to like apt on Debian or Ubuntu or um, uh, what is it, uh, DNF now for, for uh, like Rocky and CentOS. So uh, I wanted to wrap Pacman. So similarly, and I'll just actually cat it, we'll take a look at that. So similar, we're going to do you know invoke dash pacman update, put a path to the original binary there. Uh, this one I added elevation because I don't always run with root privileges. So when I do something that requires it, I need to do sudo. So we're saying elevation is required, and I'm going to say the command for that is sudo, and then I put some parameters in here. So these are all switches. So we have sync, refresh, upgrade. So if you've ever used pacman or any pa you know a derivative of uh, Arch Linux, I think they still use Pacman as the package manager. You're probably still typing Pacman SYU in the terminal, capital SYU. So that's what I've done. So let's make a module out of this through the wonders of PS readline. I want this one. So let's import that. Now I'm 
like, I always like a clean screen. So there's my command, invoke pacman update. And there's a couple gotchas here, and I didn't solve them because, again, this isn't a crescendo specific uh, session. But if I do my invoke pacman update, I'm going to pass it the SYU via the parameters that I gave the function here. So we're going to do a sync, refresh, and upgrade. I'm going to put my password in, don't hack me. And what's going to happen is going to hang. There's actually stuff that's generally being written out into the terminal, into standard out, about just I, when it does the refresh, it's like updating the repos or the mirrors. Um, we don't see that. There's probably a way with Crescendo to get that to display. You could probably convert it to like a write progress. I did not go that crazy. Because again, that's where there's some assembly required if you really want to convert something and really PowerShellize it. Um, and then again, even handling a confirmation prompt like this, uh, I don't actually know if Crescendo can handle that. Maybe it can. Um, I'm going to hit no because we're not going to be doing an update right now. And this is the output that got suppressed. Uh, so again, there's probably a way to handle this. Um, I'll let the audience here keep me honest if there is. But I just wanted to see if I could do this invoke Pac-Man update. Again, for me, I still would do a pseudo Pac-Man SYU if I was going to do it. I just, it doesn't make sense for me to create the proxy function, especially since there's a lot more to that command that I would have needed to add. And then last, this one gets into a realm where it's a little bit more practical. So on most Linux distributions now, they use systemd. Um, and you can, that's where you can use to look at your service units and manage them. Um, not, it, so again, in the, in the nature of Linux distributions, some are using still the sys5 init system. Um, and that's the, that's the beauty of choice, I guess. But I have systemd here on Arch Linux. So if I want to see what my services are, my service units, um, and actually, looks like I didn't clean up. Let me just do a quick cleanup. One second. Let me clean up these, uh, these dry run files. There we go. Good. Pretend you never saw those. So I have the same file. Let me just, that's not the one I wanted. There we go. So here's my JSON definition. I'm going to call this get-systemctl, or system control unit. That's where the original binary lives. Original command elements, this is nice, because for this command that I'm generating a proxy function for, I always want to do list units. I want no legend, no pager, and type equals service. So I want to put that filter built into it. Uh, this is nice, because uh, if I had legend and pager, parsing the output would be an absolute nightmare, because then I'd have to write even more regex to take all that nonsense out. Um, similarly, depending on your level of rights, I did put elevation true back in here. And I added a parameter. So this is fun because by default, if I run this, it's going to return everything. But if I want to specify just a single service unit, um, the original name for that, if I'm just running the native utility, is there's just nothing. There's no switch for it. That's why it's blank. I'm going to give it a parameter name called name of string, and it's just name of service unit. And here's where it gets dodgy. This is where the work comes in. Um, to translate that text output and convert it to PS custom objects, I used to use an output handler. And there's a couple things, and maybe, maybe this is some homework for me in the documentation session. There, there were some things that were not obvious about this. So I'm doing a output handler of type function, and the, the function is called parse system CTL. And I banged my head against this for a while. I was like, I don't know if this needs to be a file. I don't know what I'm, I'm doing wrong. Uh, what I learned, in short, it needs to be loaded in memory. So if I try to create this module now, and that function is not in memory of this session, it's going to explode. You're going to have a bad time. Um, so let's take a look at what that looks like before I load it into memory. We'll do, we'll do some Vim for that. Uh, my Vim's alias to NeoVim, so don't worry. This is still NeoVim. But this is what the function looks like. And it takes an input here, mandatory, which is the output. And here's what the code looks like to parse this and convert it to a PS custom object. And this is where, again, I get that Ian Malcolm feeling from Jurassic Park. Um, and if you have time and there's a, a, a useful benefit to creating these proxy functions, by all means do it. Like, again, I, I, I can see the value of Crescendo and it has some uses. Um, for me, like, I still just use the system CTL commands. Uh, there, there wouldn't be a purpose for me to use this. 
personally, but that, that's my subjective opinion. Um, but there, there are useful, but look at the regex we have to do just to make these PS custom objects. And here's where I'm gonna fully admit, I'm not a regex expert at all. I didn't write this, I use ChatGPT because I don't, have, I don't have time to try to figure that out. So, like I said, I'm not afraid of ChatGPT. Uh, it has a time and a place as well, and the time and a place is trying to figure out regex for a specific output. I think I literally just pasted the output in and said, here, this is what I want, just do it. And it did it, and it worked the first time, Tony. <laughs> so that has to be in memory. So I'm gonna load it into memory, I'm just gonna dot source it into memory there. And let's, same thing, configuration file, uh, the module name, call it PS system CTL. Let's import it, just prove that we have it in there. There's my function, and let's run it. Oh, I forgot, yep. And there they are. That's, that's pretty, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I, I did think this was pretty cool when I got it wired up. It kind of felt more like a novelty, but um, there they are, PS custom objects. These are filterable objects that I could now pipe into where object, so I don't have to do select dash string and figure out the regex there. And, you know, just because I showed you this, we can even do name, and let's just say we wanna see the U power service unit. There it is, and that is pretty cool. Um, so. Again, I, I guess the, the, the meat of this, the takeaway, just remember the four questions. It, I'm sure it makes sense, there's a time and a place, but um, yeah, that's a good segue to this. Four questions revisited. So again, for everything I showed you today, I, I think the key takeaway is just keep this in mind. Uh, don't, don't overthink it, don't be paralysis analysis. Don't try to be the hero that if you, you, know, you have a team internally and they're writing Python and it's working and everyone likes it, don't be like, no, we need to change this all to PowerShell or, or Ruby or, or shell scripts. Um, just keep these four simple questions. Who's running it? What does it need to do? Where does it need to run? And when does it need to be done by? Four, four probably makes the most sense because even if you want to do something for yourself, you know, if you don't have months to figure it out, then might be an issue. So in closing, again, I kind of spoiled this at the beginning. The core of this is just use the right tool for the job. And that's gonna be, that's gonna be very opinionated. Um, there's no right answer here. When to use a byte streaming shell versus a object-oriented shell, when to use POSIX compliant scripts or non-POSIX compliant scripts, or even something like PowerShell, which isn't even remotely POSIX compliant. So, uh, and, and for me, don't be afraid to use PowerShell on Linux. It's fine. Uh, I still use shell scripts where I need to, uh, Python where I need to, but my default shell is PowerShell. And I, you know, for the four questions, I put these just scenarios like, again, this is, this is where it gets a little subjective, I think, but do you actually wanna work with JSON without first deserializing it into an object? Personally, I don't. No offense, if you like the JQ utility and you're a whiz at filtering with JQ, then keep doing that, that's the right tool for you. Um, me, I need to work with that in, in object format and PowerShell first. And again, if a perfectly capable shell script exists, do you really wanna spend time to rewrite it? Maybe yes, maybe it depends on the time and the audience, maybe not. I already gave the Python example. And this one, did, did you catch when I was parsing my markdown? I was using Glow. I know PowerShell has show markdown. I think I actually wrote a blog on show markdown. I love it, um, but gosh darn, Glow is just, it looks so much prettier the way it renders it in the terminal. So that's the right tool for me, uh, for that job. And uh, yeah, that's all we have. The materials are there if you wanna see the session or the slides or any of that, but Cool. Thank you.